going to have uh, a panel on uh, science fiction and space exploration. Uh, we have uh, three noticed, uh, noted science fiction uh, writers and uh, a TV producer, in fact, here. Uh, I believe Michael Cassett was involved in The Outer Limits and The Twilight Zone. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, David Gerald wrote a novel, I remember, The Martian Child. Is that correct? Yes. And that was made into a movie, a very good movie. Thank you. But the book's better. Yes. In fact, and the book is better than, than the movie in a lot of cases. And yes. Granny Knits a Starship? Yeah, a Ganny Knits a Spaceship, but that's close enough. It's right, on Amazon. Thank you. you can download it to your Kindle. It's okay. very good. And, of course, um, David Brin, uh, who's the author of many science fiction works, including uh, Star Tide Rising, The Uplift War, The Postman, and uh, many others. So uh, they're going to talk about uh, how uh, science fiction has uh, influenced our, our vision and our actions into space, and perhaps how space has influenced science fiction. Um, with so, a little bit extra on Mars. And a little bit extra devoted to Mars. So with that, I'll leave it to David Brin to chair the panel and uh, take it away. Um, no particular bias, actually. If he had gone with either age or beauty, he would have chosen David Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> or talent, but, but it's just... But if you've gone for brains... Well, it, <laughs> all, I, all I need is a whole bunch of a menagerie in front of my name, and I would be Zubrin. <laughs> oh, boo. Uh, but we're, um, we're delighted to be here. I've attended a great many of these Planet Fests, and I remember several that turned into wakes. But... Um, <laughs> On the other hand, I remember several that turned into extremely giddy excitement. And uh, let's see now, which do I prefer? <laughs> I think we're in for a real treat. This is very exciting. I, 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 I was just talking to a young man at the train station on my way up here from San Diego earlier today, and I said, you have got to talk to your kids, your fellow high schoolers, and ask them why they are not simply jumping up and down and barely able to contain it to be a member of a civilization that does this kind of crap. <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got to put it that way to the kids. Because otherwise, you know, you just can't corner them. To, and I notice when I put it that way, I sometimes get a, some rapid blinks and they say, ah, oh, I never thought of it that way. Norman Mailer wrote A Fire on the Moon, and he said that he started out with typical New York sort of left-wing hostility to the nerdy defense-related NASA. But he started realizing that the, NASA was achieving not one, but two bona fide miracles. They were actually going to the moon. And he had to, had to actually say that to himself in the right tone of voice before it actually penetrated through his cynicism. He said, wow. But then he realized they were doing another bona fide miracle. They were actually succeeding at making it boring. <laughs> and if you think about it, some of the things that, makes the, that make the Enlightenment so spectacular from a historical perspective are the same things that deny us some of the romance. It's why the, the great-great-grandchildren of Enlightenment heroes who broke us away from the pyramidal-shaped social structure that dominated 99% of human cultures, uh, with the, a few nobles lording it over masses of ignorant peasants below and turning us into this diamond-shaped social structure in which a well-off and powerful middle class, educated middle class, outnumbers the poor and can outvote the rich. To accomplish something like that in the context of human history when we're all descended from the harems of the bastards who dominated this thing, what, Amazing! It's stunning, and yet the great-great-grandchildren of these heroes run flocking off to films about vampires and lords and ladies and magic and waving wands and all that sort of thing. Well, they all imagine they're going to be the knights and the lords and the ladies, not the hundred or so serfs that have to support each one of those knights. Exactly, and so the, 
the, the thing is that one of the things we do is when Columbus came back from the New World, he went straight to the palace and rumors filtered out about this exciting place. Rumors are more romantic than NASA TV. You know, let, let me... Uh, David Gerald, everybody. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'm going to add to his background um, with, um, he's going to hit me, trouble with tribbles and some other... He designed Star Trek The Next Generation. And, and don't forget I created Slee Stacks too. Yes, and wonderful, wonderful series. And um, if only I could tell you about some of the things that he's going to uh, be doing on TV in the next year. So uh, you're, one of the things that I was thinking about about Mars is that, you know, I grew up with the Edgar Rice Burroughs fantasy of Mars. And, I, you know, I want Mars to, with Barsoom and, 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 you know, Deja Thoris and Thoats and all of that. And, and then we got H.G. Wells' Mars, which, well, we didn't, Wells didn't show us what Mars was, but he said, you know, the superior technology. And then, of course, Ray Bradbury's Mars with these, you know, dark they were and golden-eyed and these great canals. And then what does NASA do? Shows, shows us this barren wasteland. And I think we're all experiencing this enormous amount of grief, this cultural sh shock that our fantasies are not real. It's like that guy who painted these great paintings of the Titanic, and then when Ballard brought back these photographs of this deteriorating, desolate corpse on the floor of the ocean, he went into grieving because he couldn't paint the Titanic sitting majestically on the floor of the ocean anymore. It was Oh my God, it's the rotting away. We're all experiencing the same phenomenon with Mars culturally. It's just, well, where's the, you know, the thoats and the this and the that? Where's the golden cities? Where's the Martians? Where's the, and instead, what we're missing is that the, we're getting the much bigger adventure and the much greater adventure of discovery. And, and the reason we're in this, I believe, is there's this great dichotomy. Those of us who read and write science fiction, we're in love with Mars. Uh, it's just this magical next frontier. Uh, but you get it into the movie theaters and almost none of the movies made about Mars or exploration of Mars have made any money. Even The Martian Child didn't do that well. Um, and that wasn't it. But uh, it's because the reality of Mars, most people aren't getting, you know, the average person, that great middle class, are not getting the real excitement of, my God, look what we're discovering, not just about Mars, but about how physics work in different environments. Uh, by the way, you can quote me on this. There are no Earth-like planets. There's only lazy writers. Um, <laughs> because what we're discovering about the nature of planetary formation, uh, the physics involved when you're farther out from the sun or lighter gravity or whatever, is so much more exciting than what Burroughs and Wells and Bradbury came up with, not to take anything away from their great work, but the, the actual adventure of discovery. Um, I think Mars is perhaps not just the greatest adventure of our generation, but possibly the greatest adventure of all human history. Well, well I would hope that our, once we have that adventure, that hmm? there will be further adventures. After beyond, that, yes. After but that. right now, Mars is, is the big one, I think. I think that there are so many things to do in the solar system, but what I, excites me about this whole thing is us because it does come down to us. Science fiction comes down to us. It, it's, you know, science fiction I think might have been poorly named. It should have been named speculative history. Because, we, <laughs> because that's what actually mo more science fiction, only 10% are scientifically trained like I, like I am. Um, but all science fiction authors read a lot of history. Because what we're talking about is extensions of this, the greatest drama, the only drama we know. Even SETI, The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which I've been engaged in as both a, an astronomer and as a um, science fiction author all my life. Nobody's been more involved in the notion of the alien than me because that's how I feel when I look in a mirror. Um, <laughs> and even when you get to SETI, what it really all comes back down to is us. The questions of how we came about. Every aspect of the Drake equation for calculating how many life forms there may be in the galaxy comes down to how we came about. The fraction, how unlikely or likely it was that life developed on Earth. How likely or unlikely it was, was it that intelligence would rise up. And if you look at all the animals out there who are at the borderline 
of intelligence, but stuck there. One of my more popular series is about whether or not humans will start uplifting or taking dolphins and chimps and some of these species that seem to be stuck at pretty much the same level as African gray parrots, possibly squid, sea lions, crows, and maybe it may, it may be that this leap that we did is extremely unlikely, and that may be one of the explanations well, it, it for the great silence. It could be that those animals have reached what uh, Lawrence J. Peter called their level of incompetency, that <laughs> essentially there's no place, uh, uh, you know, there, we were, uh, I took my niece to the zoo last week, and I was looking at the chimps and the gorillas very curiously, and realized they are so efficient at what they are doing, there's no ecological or evolutionary imperative for them to do better. Oh, I think, I think it's very, you have a, really nailed it, David. I believe that um, half a million, 200,000 years ago, even 50,000 years ago, just before the Great Leap, which happened about 35,000 years ago, um, we were idiots. I, I don't mean just less smart than us. I think we, we were just barely scratching by. And I think that helped us to make this leap. But the question is, all of these things set into perspective us. And I think this is about us. And this is why I said it the way I did say it to that high school student this morning. And that is, the, the thing that this talks about, what this, this gathering that we're at today, this event that may take place on Sunday, is that we get to be the kind of people who look past the dream of Barsoom. The, the, the failed dream that I really loved the most was wet Venus. Oh, oh yeah. the oceans. Heinlein's on, Venus. Yeah, Bradbury's Venus. Yes. The, the oceans on Venus, the dinosaurs on Venus, the princesses that you would rescue from the dinosaurs on Venus. The Ant-Man of Venus. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to instead be the kind of people who can face the starkness of the solar system and still go out into it? Amazing. I mean, that's the kind of people you are. Let me share this story, which is a little bit off topic, but it comes back to how I feel about writing science fiction is that for me, it's, I love the fiction part and the, the, you know, discovering how people can be when they're facing challenges, but I, I, it's, for me it's got to be rooted in the science. And this happened about um, 40 years ago, in 1970 something, I was, I was invited to a Star Trek convention in New York, I think it was the first one, and I was the only Star Trek writer there. And so they said, well, we want to have a panel on writing science fiction, would you be on it? And I said, all right, you know, and I hadn't really been on many convention panels before at that time. I don't think that may have been the first one. And so I arrive at the panel and I sit down and Isaac Asimov comes in and sits down next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and Isaac and I knew each other a little bit. So hi Isaac. Hi David. How are you? Like, okay. And then Hal Clement comes in and sits down on the other side of me. <laughs> hi Hal. How are you? And okay. And this little voice goes off in my head and says, um, what are you doing up there sitting between Isaac Asimov and Hal Clement? And, you know, I mean, they're giants, they're gods. They should they have, have their heads carved on, on Mount Rushmore on Mars, you know? It, it, take your time, David. <laughs> It'll happen. Okay. And, and I, I mean, I was like, I felt like I was 14 again. And you will be up there. Yeah, and, and, and the little voice on the other, so the little voice says, what are you doing sitting between Hal Clement and Isaac Asimov? And the other little voice says, keep your mouth shut or the audience is going to ask the same question. <laughs> but unfortunately, the first question, because it was a Star Trek convention, comes to me because I'm the Star Trek writer, and they asked, how important do you think ac scientific accuracy is in science? And I said, I think it is the most important part of, I mean, in science fiction. And I said, I think it's the most important part of science fiction. Uh, so if I don't know something, I pick up the phone and I call Isaac. And if he doesn't know, he picks up the phone and calls Hal. Here, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> um, A delightful, perfect answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the thing is, is that um, there's this 
community of science fiction writers who do support each other. If you don't know something, you do pick up the phone and you call and say, listen, I'm working on this planet. There's, it's it got to slip in and out of the Goldilocks zone. And, and I'm wondering about the, you know, the water, what's going to happen here, or the carbon dioxide. And as you do the math and the physics on, on world building, you realize that this is storytelling that wouldn't have been possible even 10 or 20 years ago because we didn't have this kind of information about what the Goldilocks zone is or the, you know, how much water you would have this close in or that far out. And, and I, I believe that science fiction is, is branching into two directions. There's over here the writers who are too lazy to do their research and over here the writers who are stunned by how hard it is to keep up. Well, you ha do have brilliant English majors. I'm sitting next to one who, uh, and Kim Stanley Robinson, Greg Bear, and they write the hard stuff as well as anybody. And the reason is... Because I pick up the phone. And <laughs> they pick up the phone. The cheapest consultancy fee is a phone call and an offer to name a minor character after the consultant. <laughs> if w eventually they catch on and they realize, hey, hey, you'd also buy me pizza and a beer. <laughs> That's, uh, all right, all right. But for an hour's consultation. And, and to be able to get that free from, you know, biologists or geologists, well, it happened I married a cosmogeochemist. She, uh, just a few blocks from here, she got her PhD uh, studying uh, meteoritic inclusions that figured out that it took more than one uh, supernova to seed the cloud that made our solar system that the specs came, these earliest specs came from at least five different nucleosynthetic sources. So it was mixing and like, like cream in the coffee, it was mixing all that time and it was only the shock wave from the fifth that caused us to coalesce. And I'm, she's going to so throttle me when she realizes that I spoke of this at this meeting. But, um, you know, we get in terrible fights because my doctoral dissertation 100 miles south of here was on um, cosmetology. Uh, Halley's Cosmet. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, the, 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 when you see a nature show and it shows these jets, uh, fountains on a black dust-covered comet, that, that was my dissertation. But we, the most accurate uh, representation of Halley's Comet was not from my doctoral dissertation because I could not bring myself to believe what we later found out that the the dust on the surface which I predicted would turn out to be as black as coal um, and in retrospect we realize it's carbonaceous chondrite material which is black as coal but the the work that most accurately predicted this was called Heart of the Comet. This was a novel that I co-wrote with Gregory Benford, another physicist, science fiction author. And it's just been reissued. Um, and we, we, more than, uh, we multiplied by four times the size of the nucleus. And our reason for doing so was for plot reasons because we needed to be large enough for the gravity on the surface to be high enough for people to run all over the surface shooting each other. So for plot reasons, we created the size and shape of Halley's Comet that was within 10% of accurate six months before the Giotto spacecraft went by. So a little bit of anal compulsiveness, <laughs> completely unnecessary, nobody would have called us on it, um, resulted in a work that predicted the exact size and shape of Halley's Comet. This sort of irony happens all the time in science fiction where you have a prediction that leaps out of nowhere. Um, I Am Legend yeah. um, is re predicting the internet and, and hackers. Murray Leinster did that in 1946, a logic named Joe. In uh, exactly. And then in a weirdly prophetic and horribly titled uh, novel called The Age of the Pussyfoot, um, Fred Pohl had the granddaughter of your smartphone carried around by anybody which would be basically Siri e e extrapolated yeah, yeah. Um, and everybody has them and this was in an era when 
when computers were still these giant room full of things because the sci-fi authors couldn't imagine anything else. Sometimes reality just takes you in a direction that nobody would have imagined. These 15 yeah, I've had I've had people say to me, dude, where's my flying car? It's 2012, you know. And I say, you didn't want one. What you wanted was a smartphone and a desktop computer and a wall-sized uh, 3D TV set. That's why you got that. You didn't want a flying car. You couldn't afford it anyway. And, the, and really, when you consider the road rage we see, <laughs> do you want those people over your house? No. <laughs> it's also not cost effective. Absolutely right. And mm. I, I'm, I'm giving a speech next door at the Planetary Society tomorrow about why space turned out to be so hard and why we're suddenly having a new renaissance in space now. Um, and I'm going to refer to what David said because its biggest thing factor of all is desire. Why do you think Las Vegas is where it is? I mean, you know, nothing cannot be accomplished by people with enough money, water, and desire. And we haven't had enough desire, but perhaps we're, well, the, the ice caps are melting, so we're going to have more water. I, w I want to share this insight with you. Um, I, I know a, a man named John Hanley who invented a thing called the Life Spring Training years and years ago, and I was visiting with him a couple years ago. He said something that I found kind of life-changing. He says, everything is a conversation, everything. We have no access to absolute truth. What we have is our conversations about absolute truth. And as I let this thing rattle around in my head, he went on and said, everything in life, in civilization, in whatever, starts as a conversation. The chair you're sitting in started as a conversation, a conversation about let's build a this. What will it look like? How much can we charge for it? What will we build it out of? Will it, what is it for? Where will it be used? Well, everything in life is a conversation. Well, I'm driving home, and I'm a science fiction writer, and I realize science fiction is a specialized kind of conversation. And it suddenly hits me, uh, those of us who write science fiction, and I'm not talking about the dabblers who do the little adventure stories that take place on an Earth-like planet. I'm talking about the guys who actually know some science. We're the R&D Research and Development Division of the Human Species because we are the conversation out of which the future is designed and built. Uh, Verne and Wells talked about things like going to the moon and submarines and time travel and nuclear war and et cetera. Well, that's where the conversation not only started, but gained credibility. Heinlein and Asimov and Sturgeon and Clark and, and Murray Leinster and all the other writers, James Blish, added enormous more credibility to these conversations so that by the time NASA was in full bloom and science fiction writers were paying attention, hey, look, this is really happening, we were getting fan letters from astronauts and people who were building spaceships. Can I have your autograph? I grew up with your stories. And I was at the SpaceX plant a couple months ago, and they were asking me for my autograph because they grew up with my stories. And I'm thinking, you guys are doing it. I'm asking for your autograph. I'm the fanboy here. You're doing it. All I ever did was talk about it. But the conversation has enormous power. Our conversations about the moon, the Mars, all of this is where we create the future we want to live in. And, and this is an enormously powerful and liberating insight when you stop to think about what conversation do you want to create. The, 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 I think you underrate yourself. Did you ever see Quest for Fire? Yeah. Well, when you and Heinlein and others were keeping this ember alive, you know, then, then the, the guys came and they took the fire and they put it in, a, in, yeah, in and yeah. they started making steel and things like that. Couldn't have happened without you keeping the ember alive, David. <laughs> I, only, I only did a small part. I took the part that Heinlein created and, you know, stoked the, 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 the what do they call those I'm, I'm treating things. him as if he's that much older I'm than me. I'm not that much older <laughs> than you, you know. know. I mean, I know. okay, I saw I Love Lucy first run, but I'm not that old. <laughs> hey, I, 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 saw, I saw Twilight Zone first run. Uh, no, you're not that much older than me, but what you did is you got started earlier because I wasted all that time in science. <laughs> Well, I was impatient. I wanted to get started. And they, you know, my biggest handicap for uh, many years was you're too young, get some experience, you know, and as you get older, you'll, you see, and one day I say, well, look, I'd like to, do no, you're too old. We need to get young, new talent. <laughs> and my reaction was, fuck you. When was my moment? Nobody told me. How did I miss it? 
Um, I, 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 I'm going to make him hit me by, 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 by basically saying, describing his moment as... <laughs> I'll tell you something. And, and it, triples have opened a lot of doors for me, and I have no regrets, partly because, you know, when you think about it, more than a billion people have seen the trouble with Tribbles, and most of them have laughed. And if you have the ability to do something that makes a million people smile or laugh, that's uh, powerful. Closer to a billion than a million. I said billion. Oh, said but the second billion. time you said million. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, if you can make people laugh and smile, that's a lot better than making them furrow their browns, uh, brows and go, meh, meh, meh. Although anger tends to energize people um, more than laughter. T tell, <laughs> tell that to Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I have to say something about the Goldilocks zone since it was raised. And it's very important as far as planetary science is concerned to give you a sense of perspective about what we're doing here and about Mars. Um, if you talk to the greatest planetary atmospherics experts, um, they will tell you that there is something to James Lovelock's notion of what's called the Gaia hypothesis. Not the extreme, not the strong Gaia hypothesis, which is mystical. The Gaia hypothesis is the notion that the Earth is actually alive. It has some of the homeostatic properties of a living planet. Um, it, it has self-correcting loops. And um, it keeps its ocean, except for during the Kirschfink episodes, named after a professor who's just you know a few blocks from here, where I did my undergrad. Um, who discovered that there was I that the Earth became an ice ball for a period of time. And thank heavens, because apparently life being put right up against the edge with that ice ball, the volcanoes were spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and no carbon dioxide was being pulled out because the ice was preventing the processes in the ocean that pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, causing this balance. And they think that the, that the great ice sheet covering the entire planet melted within 200 years. That, yeah, quick, that, that. Qu that quickly, <laughs> because the carbon dioxide had built up and there was a hysteresis loop. Well, that happened because the, Earth, the sun is gradually heating up. <coughs> and Woody Allen promised us five billion years before we enter red giant phase and the Earth is consumed by the expanding red giant phase of the sun. But it's actually, we only have about 100 million years. And the reason is because we're skating the very inner edge of our sun's continuously habitable or Goldilocks zone. And at, here at the inner edge, uh, and that inner edge is pushing outward, and in 100 million years, it'll reach the point where even if we had zero greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, we would not be able to cool off fast enough and deserts will spread. Which means that if we blow it, extinguish ourselves, Earth will have one more chance because it took 65 million years after the dinosaurs. You see the timing there. Now it turns out the Goldilocks zone actually extends way out there. Had Venus and Mars switched places, had Mars been a lot larger, had Mars been the size of Earth, we would have a sister ocean world right now because it was size, it was the lack of plate tectonics, it was the lack of enough size to hold in an atmosphere that killed Mars. Had Mars been larger, it would have settled on a Gaia balance with a very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere that had oceans. And all we would have needed to land there and talk to whoever was there is just a mask, a face mask, that would uh, keep the carbon dioxide out. The reason why we don't have that is because Mars was tragically small. The, in any event, I thought I'd let you know about this m aspect of the continuously habitable zone because it's all in the news because 15 years ago we knew of no planets outside the solar system. Now we know of at least 1,000 with hints of 3,000 others. And there are people in our civilization who aren't jazzed about being members of a civilization who can do crap like this? <laughs> that's the real culture war. That's the real culture war that's going on here. Excuse me, one thing that I'm correct, I've never referred to this. 
And Mars would have had, the, the gentleman said the big difference is that Mars doesn't have a magnetic field and therefore it did not create an ozone layer and so on and so on. No, 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 it's all right. No, no, it's all right. This is a valid point. I, I really am interested. Please let him. However, sir, if Mars had been the size of the Earth, it, it would have differentiated, have had, had an iron core, and probably had a magnetic field. <laughs> uh, go, go on, David. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, uh, while, while he gathers his thoughts, let me just complete with the Goldilocks zone, and that is that this may be the anomalous feature about the Earth that we skate the inner edge. And we may have anomalously high oxygen content and anomalously small, I mean anomalously large continents for a water life world. Okay. In which case that could help explain why we seem to be alone in the cosmos, something called the Fermi paradox or the great silence. Okay. Um, you know, we not only have a Goldilocks zone in the solar system, there's a Goldilocks zone in the galaxy that solar systems, uh, systems that can uh, uh, have a Goldilocks zone can only exist far enough out from the bright core at the center of the galaxy, but not too far out. There's a whole theory on that that I have not bothered to, you know, it's like, okay, there's a Goldilocks zone. I, that, I don't need to know this now. Look up Peter Ward's Rare Earth. He tells, he's uh, from that point of view of, of that, 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 uh, that life is rare. Now, I, I got into it with uh, uh, one of those people who says, well, you know, evolution's impossible, it has to be intelligent design and blah, blah, and God and, 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 and you know, the Bible says this. And, and I tend to uh, say, okay, if that's what you want to believe, fine. Um, me, I, my, I go to the Church of the Chocolate Bunny. We have a lot more fun. <laughs> and... Um, but, and I'm Pope Daniel I of the Church of the Chocolate Bunny, so what I say goes. But um, uh, do the math. Uh, the universe is how many, uh, you know, what is it, 13 billion years old? Uh, I, the universe has taken 13 billion years to discover it's 13 billion years old. Um, and there's how many billions, trillions of galaxies and how many billions of stars in each galaxy. So. If the odds against life are, let's say, one in one trillion, life is not just uh, an accident, it's inevitable. And so we're, if we think, you know, Earth-centric, look how wonderful we are, uh, and is there other life out there? Actually, we're looking at it uh, wrong. There's this, this speck of dust that's a galaxy, and there's a speck of dust within the galaxy that's a star, and there's a speck of dust. There's a lot of them. This one just happened to be the one out of all the gazillions of possibilities where it all came together in just the right way for a while. So I, I hold that life is, inev is inevitable. Uh, we are proof of it. Um, the fact we're even having this conversation about is there life out there, other life out there, is, uh, it strikes me as one of the silliest possible conversations because we're proof that life is inevitable in the most unlikely of circumstances. And the issue is not is there life out there, but is it close enough or is it existing within our time frame that we have a chance of discovering it? Yeah, the, the, you can even uh, answer them on a, in a religious sense, and that is, if God made all that and just made us <laughs> to contemplate it, what a waste of a great simulation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, it really would indicate somebody of very minimal curiosity. Well, yeah. And I, I personally, I don't. I think that was, that's far more insulting of God than anything we could we could do or say. Yeah. When they tell me God is perfect, I say, Yeah. Tell me about the appendix, <laughs> or if if you really want to go there, let's talk about how the vagus nerve loops down and around. 
um, when it would be far more efficient to go straight through. But if you look at the giraffe, it goes all the way down the neck and back up again. And that doesn't need a loop, but that's evidence that the giraffe evolved from something where it was a straight connection. And uh, you know, David, a lot of the people I'm in this audience are good. female. They know darn well that God makes mistakes, but he try, but he improves. Yeah, they marry them. But but he, <laughs> but but he but he does move in the right direction. <laughs> Um, I, I want to quote uh, Rosalind Yallow, who won the Nobel Prize for, uh, I believe it was chemistry. Uh, I don't know the details, but a reporter asked her, what's it like to be so smart? And she said, very lonely. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason for conventions like this one, is to actually, people like us can be in a room with people like us, where we can talk about things like planetary physics without people asking, what planet are you from? <laughs> There are so many cool aspects to what's going on. Um, I'm going to tell you one. And I s promised my wife that I would not reveal this to any fellow science fiction authors, but I love you this much. <laughs> now I have to go in the hotel room tonight. I have to write this story because this guy is, is, is so spectacular. All right. You know, you've heard of Europa. You know that there's ice, uh, or ice roof. It's a roofed world. And uh, there's probably water underneath. You've heard that Enceladus is probably like this too. What you don't realize is that these two may be just two out of 12. Oof. There may be as many as 12 to 15 roofed ice worlds, roofed water worlds in our solar system. It may very well be that this is where most life in the universe forms. And one of these candidate worlds is Titan. Now you imagine what it would be like to be on Titan, where you have gasoline seas and wax mountains and, and creatures made of wax, and underneath their feet is the rumble of very, very hot creatures where the water is molten who are drilling their way up. <laughs> and then we land and they assume that we're going to wage war on behalf of our fellow molten water creatures and we say, what? <laughs> no, you're far more interesting. You're made of wax. <laughs> but how and, long? And we are bags of water. <laughs> Bags, really? bags of molten water. Bags, bags of molten water. Okay, yes. yeah. Well, this, this, would, this would have been a great for Hal Clement. Yeah. yeah Hal this. would have loved this. Hal was probably, uh, you know, more than Isaac, who we all admired, but much more than Isaac. Hal was a, a high school chemistry teacher, and he worked so hard on the science of his stories that he set the standard for everybody else in the field, and he did it with his first novel, Mission of Gravity, he, he just said, look, stop with the Earth-like planets. This is what we're really going to be looking at. Things so weird, so bizarre, so strange, that it goes beyond what we've been doing. And writers, after you had read Mission of Gravity, you never, ever believed in common Earth-like planets anymore. You wanted the real adventure of what you have in a planet where its gravity is squashed it into a dish a disc shape, uh, Terry Pratchett aside. Uh, <laughs> but Hal Clement, and then with works after that, uh, he continued to do that. And essentially, it was a, uh, a warning shot across the bow of the entire field. Stop making things up and get your science right. Uh, between him and Heinlein and Asimov and, and Clark, uh, the science fiction field was blessed with this, this uplifted to steal your term, this uplifting of the entire genre. And then Bradbury came along. We went to the same high school, not far south But here. not at the same time. Not he was the there before time. you, yeah, yeah, a exactly couple years. Yeah, exactly 30 years apart. <laughs> but, um, and uh, <laughs> there will be an appreciation of Ray Bradbury and of Sally Ride during the, um, either this conference or the one next door. Um, I, I, wrote, I, I wrote a few of those tributes. Um, and he came in and he said, okay, well, what about those of us who could not add two plus two? We still get to root for this civilization. Um, I'm just, all I'm going to give you is poetry. 
you know, I'm not even going to bother making the phone calls. The, <laughs> the rocket is beautiful. It arrives. It gets them there. And then what happens? So there's room for the poets. It, there's, it's, actually, the poet is the payload. Poet is the payload. Because if you're going out to the stars, you've got to have someone there who can go, oh, wow, look at that, in better language than, oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> And, and it may be that's what we need in this community. We need more of this. We need some way of getting to the high school kids. I mean, look around you. There are young faces in this crowd. But if you look at the average, it's mostly boomers. And we've got to do something about that. We've got well, to do something about that in science fiction fandom also. There's a, a meme floating around. I don't know if I believe it or not, but uh, people have said, uh, it goes back a long way. Uh, somebody at NASA said, if Star Trek had stayed on the air, we'd have been on Mars by now. Uh, that essentially inspiring science fiction, uh, positive and optimistic science fiction, inspires engineers and designers and, and even funding in Congress to do great things. Um, and, and uh, uh, oh, I forget the writer. Uh, he was pissing, oh, Gibson, I think it was, or... or William Gibson? Yeah, somebody was pissing. Uh, yeah, he was pissing and moaning that uh, science fiction has gotten so dystopic, that's the reason why we're not having space adventures anymore. And my reaction was, well, isn't that arrogant of you to think that you have that much power? Um, but uh, the point is, is valid, is, is like we've been spending so much time pissing and moaning about how awful the future is going to be. We aren't looking around, and I've been accused of being way too optimistic, and how dare I be optimistic about the future. Um, but the fact is, I look around and say that the rate of acceleration of technological advance is having a, the, uh, you know, Moore's Law, uh, our computers, our phones, our whatever, are the technologies expanding um, at an accelerating rate. Well, that means that our scientific abilities and our scientific knowledge is also going to be expanding at an accelerating rate. There are things we can do and discover. There are things we can do with the data we're getting that was impossible just a few years ago. And when you realize that the tools are making it possible for us to do much more than ever before, you realize we are on the threshold of not just a singularity, but a transformation. Indeed. And um, well, well, why, well, why, why don't we open it up for questions? Yeah, please. What time? What, 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 oh, uh, we have time. It is. Okay, um, we have another uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, we have 10 great. minutes. Well, well was that, was that applauding the fact that we have another 10 minutes? They're, they're applauding the fact they get to go to the bathroom or, in 10 minutes. Or, or, is, it, or is, is my zipper? Uh, yes. Uh, you can, but you have to credit the source because it's going into my quote book. <laughs> See, I, cause I Oh. oh. Thank you. Oh, well, look at that. Did, did you have a follow-up question? Um, well, well, let's uh, think, of, think about it. Oh, we, we knew that a long time ago when... Well, when yeah. you... When you, um, you, you, some of you might have watched um, John Stewart about three months ago when he said, uh, oh, we'll go back to the stupid, boring presidential election in a minute, but first this! And they showed the news report about planetary resources and the billionaires who are funding going off and mining asteroids. Well, after my PhD, I worked for the California Space Institute down at San Diego, which was headed by Sally Ride. And uh, we, we studied all sorts of things, including asteroid mining back in the 80s when we thought it was going to happen the next day. And I'll be talking about this during my speech tomorrow. And the, the point is, I, you know, I knew a lot of these people. And all of a sudden, it's coming true. And so he's, he shows the clip of the report. And John Stewart says, asteroid freaking mining. Are you freaking kidding me? And the uh, New York audience is going absolutely ape. And he says, this is what the news in 2012 was supposed to be like. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait. Make it better. Make it better. And they, they, they dress the news announcer in silver. 
<laughs> it will all change when they finally get the right fat pills so that we can wear spandex. Spandex is and, a privilege, uh, not a right. Yes. So <laughs> when, when, when we all look good enough that we can wear spandex, um, then I'm telling you, the future will be here. Forget the singularity. I, yes. I, I tried spandex about 20 pounds ago, and even then it was <laughs> shuddering. It was just awful. <laughs> David? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Which one? <laughs> what were uh, your thoughts when the next generation reprised the trouble with Tribbles? Uh, it was Deep Space Nine, and I thought they did. Uh, the question is, what were my thoughts about the Deep Space Nine remake of the Trouble with Tribbles? I thought they did a brilliant job, and. Uh, I was very impressed with the script and the production values and... Uh, and the fun. Just the it flat was fun. out fun. It was fun. I thought it was great. It just, you know... And you, I was very honored. Yeah. So, sometimes, sometimes you have to go to the movie and you turn down certain dials. I mean, otherwise my wife and daughter would kill me in, the, in theaters. And I go in and I turn down usually my logical dial at least three notches. You know, intelligence, all these things. I went to see The Fifth Element, I reached in and ripped out all the wires. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, I was sitting there drooling and the sheer fun pouring off the screen, I was saying, I'm getting, I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> Not my, my prefrontal lobes are trying to claw uh, their way out of my head, but... I, I had learned a lesson, and this goes way, way back. The film was Suspiria, which I had no desire to see, but somebody we knew had worked on it, so we all decided, going in, we knew it was going to be a terrible movie, and we said, well, if I'm spending this much to sit through a movie, I'm going to have a good time, even if it's shit. And we did. We just we said, okay, we're going to see a bad movie, and we're going to enjoy a bad movie being bad, and we did. And after that, ever since then, it's like, if I'm paying now like 17 bucks, I don't care if the movie's any good or not. I'm going to have fun. <laughs> I'm going to get my $17 at, worth. At minimum, you go at the 10 a.m. showing with a couple friends, and you do Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, anybody else? Somebody over there, and then yeah. we'll take from the side. Oh, and then somebody in the back. Yes. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for Star Trek. You're that welcome. Was, I would have not been able to sit through like an optics class if I wasn't thinking about making a phaser the whole time. So that whole experience was fantastic. Well, well, let me say on behalf of everybody who ever worked on the original Star Trek, uh, thank you. Because if it weren't for the enthusiasm of the audience, we'd be forgotten. <laughs> so it's the enthusiasm of the audience that made the whole adventure so much fun. And, and, and uh, he's... He's, uh, the, he's the one who came up with the name Picard. Oh.